is your brother and he's toxic. You know, she had left the incest behind, but the incest actually got worse. Is this blatant sexism? Hello my dear friends, my name is Sanne and welcome back to another beauty video. Today we're discussing another book and we're finally talking about part 3 of the Gardener King series today. We're finally at the end, the final part. Yay! We survived three entire parts of the series. Did we enjoy them? Yes. Was there a lot wrong with them? Also yes. Let's discuss, shall we? Just like the previous two videos, I do want to give you a small warning before we get into it because this video is going to be completely uh, full of spoilers. Um, I'm gonna discuss the entirety of the book, everything that is needed to properly discuss this book. There's gonna be spoilers all around, so if you still want to read the books, just stop watching this video, go read the books and then come back. If you wanna know what the books are about, in part one I do have a nice spoiler free summary at the beginning of the video so you can decide if this book series maybe is something for you that you'd want to read or not and then you can decide if you want to watch this series or not so absolutely go do that I'll link the video up here so with that out of the way we're gonna get into our spoilery book review of The Price of a Kingdom by Monica Booth part 3 of the Gardener King series I'm gonna be doing my makeup in the meantime while I'm telling you this story and it's gonna be inspired by the book cover so I'm gonna do purple today let's get into it so part 3 picks up about two or three weeks or something after the last book ended and as we know the last book ended with in running back to the cave to Fuelan and Erlis to tell them that Rian is alive. And also just a quick side note, I'm pronouncing everything differently in this video because after filming part two I figured out that there was a video online by the author on how to pronounce the names in this book. Turns out I'm pronouncing everything wrong. <laughs> so I'm gonna try and do it right for this video. It's not Indian, it's Anine. Okay, so Anine is back with Erlis and Fuelan. Suddenly she has decided that this is her fight to fight, which she decided it wasn't in the last book. But still, now that uh, Rian is involved, she decides it is her fight to fight. So she wants to break into Kaelach's castle because she is convinced that Kaelach is keeping Rian there in the cellar somewhere because, you know, it is a good hiding place. And no one will hear them there. But she is absolutely convinced that he is keeping Rian there. Since Rian has to be alive because of the flowers, Kaelach is keeping him there. So Aeon wants to break into Kaelach's castle to try and save Rian. But Erlis and Fuelan are kind of against it because they don't really just want to go in like right at that moment. And Anin is like, we've been waiting for three weeks, we can't wait any longer, we have an opportunity now, we need to go in now. And Erlis and Fuelan are like, we need to plan everything a bit more, you know, so we make sure that we really don't get caught and killed in the meantime. Because that would be very highly unfortunate. So in the entirety of the first few chapters, Anin is just basically a really annoying, unruly teenager. And I really do not like her in the first few chapters. Because the only thing she cares about right now is saving Rian. And it's the only thing she thinks about, only thing she cares about. And she cares about it even more than the well-being of her friends. Because she needs her friends there. She's like, but we're, we're going now. We have to go now. Even though I'm risking your lives, but you don't get any input on how we're doing this. She's just being really um, stubborn and annoying and very like... I want to save Rian, so we're gonna go save Rian right now. She even says at one point, like, what? You think I'm not willing to die for him? Yes, you may be, but we're not. <laughs> You're forcing us to come. So, you know, thought about that. She'd really rather go into the castle, immediately fail and get killed, than set up a proper plan that actually works and really save Rian. She's not thinking clearly at all. And Anine is also thinking that um, <laughs> the entire reason Freyland doesn't really want to join in this trip is because he's jealous. Because of course she has been growing closer and closer to Freyland. And she's thinking like, he, he must know that now with Rian back in the picture, 
what we had just isn't there anymore. I'm like, well, that, that was uh, a very quick and easy and sudden decision to just dump him immediately. Now your brother lover is back. So she basically, like in the first chapter, already says that she doesn't want to be with Raylan, which you know I'm mad about. I don't want her going back to her brother. Who even wants that for her? It's just weird. And now she's like literally at the beginning of the book. Like I had high hopes for this book. For it being like a love triangle thing. And her choosing Freyland at the end or something. But now like literally the first chapter it is already confirmed. She will not go back to Freyland. And she will just go with Rian. And it already makes me pissed. <laughs> so anyway. They're having discussions about trying to save Rian. Erlis is in contact with one of the girls working in Kenach's castle. So she can arrange for them to go into the castle on one of the days that Kalax isn't there. Which would be tomorrow. That's why Anine is like, we need to leave, we need to go, we need to go save him. And Erlis and Freyland aren't really up to the plan yet. But in the end, Erlis and Freyland basically decide to go with Anine anyway and do it. Because they're basically afraid that she's gonna get herself killed because she's probably just gonna go out and do it anyway and get herself killed in the process so they're basically just trying to protect her so they're like okay fine we'll come with you whatever they arrange for the door to be opened by the person working in the castle and there's barely anyone there so they sneak into the castle um they manage to get into the cellars and look into them and see if rian is there and Big Shock, he's not there, actually. So, you know, that's uh, finally one of the first things that happens that's, like, not coincidentally absolutely wonderful. <laughs> so Erlis is like, okay, we leave now, because that was the deal that they made. If something goes wrong, they leave. But Anine is like, okay, but he's here, definitely. Then if they're not keeping him in the cellars, they're keeping him in, in the secret room. You know, the secret room that Kalak supposedly kept his daughter in for years. That they visited in the previous book. That room. So she's convinced, like, if he's not in the cellars, he has to be there. And Freylan, for some reason, is like, okay, fine. We'll go look for him. Even though they have no time. They're in the enemy's castle. They decide to go look upstairs anyway. They manage to find the secret room. Freylan manages to look inside. But right at that moment, they can hear Kalak coming back so you know they need to leave they need to get out of there but one thing is confirmed he does see Rian up there so Rian is there and Rian basically told him like quickly get Anin out of here because she's not safe here so they're trying to leave and Anin is just being the most annoying little brat ever she's like no I need to save him I'm here now anyway and he needs to know that I'm here for him and that I still love him. So basically their enemy, who's trying to kill all of them, is in the castle with them already. And she is just upstairs screaming. Like, absolutely screaming. And scream, screaming Rian's name as well. Um, so, you know, way to mess that up. Because now Kaelach knows that he's harboring the king's son. So she basically manages to mess everything up in like two seconds just because she's stubborn and annoying and she didn't want to let Rian go just like that. And like she could have just gone back for him a day later or something. Then he still knows that you were there. So he knows you're alive. He knows you're looking for him. And then you could have just come back in a few days. And I just find this so annoying because Imion is such... An annoying brat in these first few chapters and it feels like all of the character development that she went through especially in book two where she was just a very clear thinking intelligent girl who knew what she was looking for who knew what she wanted um, who was living for herself she's just basically it feels like the way she's acting all of that is non-existent anymore so it just makes me a bit sad to see all of that lovely character development just be thrown out the window. She's basically reverting back to her teenage self living on the island. The trio does manage to escape the castle um, and they kind of have a little get together in the castle gardens because they know Kalach won't really look there because he doesn't like the place. Um, so they just have a discussion there because of course Erlis is 
mad that everything went wrong and no one listened to her. Even though that was the agreement they made that they would listen to her. And if she said, we're gonna go home, they were gonna go home. So she's mad, which is understandable. And they have this like discussion about everything. One thing, like it doesn't really have much to do with the story right now, but one thing that Alice mentions is that she has also been to the shadow world before. And the reason she went is because her mom was dying and she wanted to save her. And she thought making a bargain with the shadow creatures would save her mom, but then in the end she decided not to do it because that would probably not be what her mother wanted. And she says this to Anine, like, maybe Rian doesn't want to be saved right now because he told us to get you out of there. So maybe do what he wants because you're thinking you're doing what he wants, but you're not doing what he wants. Uh, so maybe just show him that you love him by respecting his wishes, basically. So what she says is, so I walked away, I let my mother die. I think perhaps it was the most loving thing I ever did. But Anine thinks, but she's wrong. That's not love. Love is fighting to the end. Love is giving it all. Love is spilling your blood like rose petals. Rian taught me that. And if he can do it for me, I can do it for him. So yeah, she's very much back to her uh, teenage bullshit. She's literally thinking so simplistically, not being able to see that there are different types of love, different ways to show love. She's literally like, Rion died for me, so now I have to die for him. Because Rion loves me and he died for me, so that is the only way someone can show me love. So that's also the only way I can show someone else love, so I have to die for him. Why? Anyway, she annoys me. She does. She's glorifying Rion again. Especially, like, basically from the moment he died, all his sins were forgiven, basically, by her at least. So, it just annoys me. Anyway, Erlis and Fuelan make Inine return to the cave that they were hiding in. So, they go there um, and they decide to stay there for the night and see what their options are in the morning. And then Inine does another irrational thing again because she basically decides to just get up in the middle of the night and go to Kelag and um, basically go in face-to-face -face combat with him because that is how she thinks she can save her brother. So for some reason she still calls him father which I find very interesting because she has basically denounced him. She basically refused to call Atha her father as soon as she found out Kelag was her father and now she doesn't want Kelag but she still calls him father, I guess. So she basically stands in front of the castle like, Kelag, father, come out of here, face me, bitch. She even tries to trade herself in, in exchange for Rian, which is definitely not what he would have wanted. He basically would have traded himself back for Inin. So, so she offers that, but Kelag says, I don't have him, I don't know where he is. So, and like, it seems like she just has a death wish basically even though a big plot point of part two was that she was overwhelmed and sad after Rian died and she at first didn't want to live but then in the end she decided that she did want to live and it was like a really big point of the book like her deciding to choose for herself deciding that she does want to live on um start really living again and now she's just like she has some kind of death wish she's just like i'm leaving I'll trip myself in, it's fine. So, I don't know, it really feels like they're undoing everything that she did. So, while Kaelark is, you know, actively trying to kill her in combat, they do have some sort of conversation in the meantime. And Aeneon is definitely losing this battle, which we all could have guessed. She doesn't have that much combat experience at all. And thankfully, that is the moment that Foelan and Arlis come back in and they basically save her ass because um, she couldn't do it herself. Why did she even go out there in the first place? So they managed to overpower Kaelach and they actually tried to kill him, but for some reason, the sword basically just bounces off of him and he has absolutely not a single scratch on him. So they can't kill him, so they want to try and tie him up but <laughs> when they're basically tying him up Indian decides to just up and leave like they need her they're saying like Indian you need to do this we need to do that because they're with three basically teenagers young adults trying to overpower 
a strong warrior man, I guess. So, you know, they need her help. And she's just like, what? What's going on over there? I was going to go over there. And she just doesn't respond either. Like, they're calling after her. She's like, ignoring them. The reason she's walking away is because she recognizes the sounds of the garden. Um, because the garden is starting to sound alive again. And the reason for that is because she runs towards the edge of the garden. She finds Rian there. Rian has escaped from the castle. Which is also so funny, basically, to me. Apparently, the, the way he escaped, he escaped with, like, he let the vines grow. And just basically opened the window for him and create a ladder to climb down to. So... He could have been, he could have escaped like six months ago. He's been trapped in there for six months. And this is just toxic to me. Because he's just, he's saying to Anin, Seeing you again gave me the strength to actually walk out. Because I thought you didn't love me anymore. So I just didn't even try to escape. Even though he could have like escaped. Maybe try to find her, talk it out. No. No, he's just like, I was pretty sure you didn't love me anymore, so I'm just gonna wallow in self-pity for six months being captured by the enemy, even though I had ample opportunity to leave. Like, literally the same day. Because they also find out later that he did die when Kela killed him, but when he was dra drug dragged, whatever, through the gardens, the gardens basically came alive again because of him, and they healed his body while he was being drug through the garden and then the moment he got to the um, castle he was basically healed again he had not a single scratch on him so it wasn't even like he was healing or something the man really had no excuse not to try and escape except for the fact what he says i thought you didn't want me anymore so i just stayed i guess which i feel like is just so manipulative and he also makes Anine feel like she it's her fault that all of this happened. I mean, some point it's a tiny bit her fault, but also she told him many, many times, you need to leave, I don't want you here. And he stayed and then he got himself killed. That's not her fault, but he makes her feel like it's her fault. And at one point she even apologizes for all of this and he's just like, it's fine. I don't think the man has apologized a single time in this book. So they're talking in the gardens and Alice and Fuelan catch up to them and they notice that it's Rian standing in front of them so they kneel because this is their king I guess or at least it's Alice's king. Even Anine starts calling Rian my lord which I think is just such a weird power imbalance. Anyway now they know that Kelag has seen all of their faces so he knows they're basically hanging out with Fuelan in those caves so he knows where to find them so they're like we can't go back to the caves where do we go so they run towards the woods because ruin is like the woods are a safe place we just you know woods are very 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 safe because he loves the woods so he takes them there and there they stay for like two days or something. They have a couple of discussions. Rion is just being... I, I, I feel like he's being so weird. Because he's just really calm and smiley the entire time. Just like, my subjects. I appreciate you. We're gonna go back to the island now. We don't want to be here. And every time like... Ugh, someone's like, but why? Uh, that's a stupid decision or something. He's like, it's what my father would have wanted. So... Like, he says, Anine and I are gonna go back to the island. You can join if you want, I guess. But we're just gonna go back now. And Erlis is like, you're just gonna leave the people here with this man as their king? And he's like, yeah, but we didn't get here in the first place to fight Kelag. We never came here to fight Kelag. We came here to figure out who Anine's parents are. And that's it. Even though in book one he was like almost horny for the throne. Like he was staring at the castle like, I need to be there. He was the one who kept bringing up Kaelar and kept bringing up like, we need to convince these people that what they're seeing is wrong, you know. Ugh. And now he's suddenly Mr. Wise Guy. Like we never came here for that. That wasn't our plan. So we don't need to do that. We just need to return now because we came, we know what we came here for. 
he annoys me. And there's also a lot of discussions between just Rion and Anine, because of course they're finally together after months. So they want to talk about stuff. Like they're talking about everything that happened in the past few months, basically. And at one point he even asks her like, did something happen between you and Fuelan? Because of course he had that feeling. And he starts to be like really grumpy about it. Like he asks her about it, like, how about Fuelan? And he, she was like, I don't know. And then he just like drops her hand because he was holding her hand. Just like, I just like being grumpy. And I'm just like, my man, you were dead for six months. The girl thought you were dead. It isn't weird that she's maybe possibly slightly dating a different guy. And he's being like really jealous and upset about it. And every time she's like, she has to rush to say something, but like, oh, but nothing happened. Oh my God, no, but it, it's not that deep. She's acting like she cheated on him. The man was dead. So this is also where Anine decides that she really does not want anything to do with Fuelan. So she basically tells him like, because he actually offers to give up his throne to be able to marry her. And she's like, yeah, but it's not what I want. Because I want Rian. It's like, okay, good, good on you for, you know, knowing what you want. But also, he's your brother and he's toxic. Her and Fuelan are basically not ever happening, which makes me sad. So after a bit of thinking, Enin is like putting all the puzzle pieces together. She realizes that from the things that Kiara, the Shadow Witch, has told her, she has basically told her that Kayla has made a deal with some shadow creatures. And she's thinking like, you know, he was, we couldn't even hit him with a sword. So what if he made a deal with the shadow creatures to basically trade me in for immortality, for protection? So basically that's what happened. So Enin is like, well, you know what this means, right? We can take away his immortality because I'm still alive. So he didn't uphold his end of the bargain. So we can basically go to the shadow creatures, tell them like, hey, his daughter's still alive. He didn't uphold his end of the bargain. And then he will be not longer protected or immortal. And we can kill him or at least get rid of him. So that's Anine's plan. That basically, the entire group doesn't agree with her because it's dangerous. Because she is Kellogg's daughter, so his blood th flows through her veins. So that means that he is able to give her blood away, because the blood can only be given, not taken. So he's able to give her blood away, and he has already. So basically, if the witches or the shadow creatures find out that she is alive, they're allowed to just freely take um, her blood and kill her, I guess. Because it basically belongs to them, because Kellogg has given it to them 18 years ago. So after some discussion, they do agree that it's one of the few op options that they have. But the group decides to part ways. So Fuelan is going to go back to Lochmar to fight his brother and take back the throne. And Erlis wants to go to Bryn to keep an eye on Kellogg. But also that confuses me, because just a few chapters... like pages ago basically they were discussing like hey Erlis can your dad help you get out of the country because you need to leave the country because you're a wanted woman now and now she's just gonna stay in Bryn basically next to where Kailaki lives which is a bit weird to me um, but anyway she goes on to do that so the group splits up and Rian and Inian make their way over to Kiara's house the shadow witch's house because they want to ask her like basically who are these witches that you were talking about and where can we find them um or the witches the shadow creatures they call them the sisters <laughs> and they have some more lovely heartwarming conversations throughout their traveling towards this cottage because you know it creeps me out because i don't know when your brother who's 21 and you're 18 tells you that he's loved you for so many years now I've been in love with you for years. That's just creepy. Like, has he been grooming her? Or something? Because for years? She didn't even know that y'all could be something, I guess. So she never thought about it. And he's like, I've been in love with you. It's weird. Ugh. Anyway, they end up at Kiara's cottage. She isn't there, so they move towards the Shadow World. 
because they think maybe she's there then, I guess. So they find Kira. Kira is also very happy to see them because, of course, she thought Rion was dead. Her beloved, beloved gardener king, whose blood she loved so much. So she's just excited to see them. So they ask her about the sisters, who are basically just really powerful shadow creatures. And they're, of course, very different from Kira, because Kira is basically just a human turned witch. But these are basically real shadow creatures. They're made out of shadows. They don't really exist beyond shadows. So they decide to look up the sisters in the shadow world, but they have to be really, really quick because the shadow world has no food or water or whatsoever in it, except what you bring yourself, which is blood. It's basically the only thing, your blood or your flesh. So if you're there, you can't be there longer than like a day or something, because then you'll dry out. So they go out to find the sisters and they arrive at the first sister who is basically made out of the birds that are the flowers in this world, the yellow birds. And they tell her like, hey, Kellogg lied to you 18 years ago because his daughter is still around somewhere. They don't say that Enin is his daughter, they just say like his daughter is around somewhere. And she's like, okay, my sisters need to know because that means that we have been bamboozled and we can't have that rumor flying around. So we need to go to my sisters and have counsel about what we're gonna do. So she takes Anine and Rian, go to the second sister. The first sister is named Lil, and the second one is named Siofra. Siofra is made out of toads, frogs, so also fun. But she's more like fun personality, I guess. She wants to be friends with Anine really really bad and she's like oh please come hang out with me and she's like stalling everything just so she can hang out with Anine basically and she tells Anine a lot about Myrna who is Anine's mother Kaelak's wife so he tells she tells her a lot about Myrna because Myrna apparently was a witch herself and she visited the Shadow World a lot. And then she became good friends with Siofra. And she also tells her about all those deals that Myrna wanted to make and that Kerak wanted to make. So it turns out Myrna at one point introduced Kerak to the sisters. And Kerak knew already by then that he wanted to um, take over the throne. So he informed what some sort of spell like that would cost. It would cost their child, because Myrna was pregnant at the time. And Myrna was like against it. And she apparently noticed like everything that Kellogg was doing, like setting up to take over the throne, going against his best friend, the king and whatever. And she basically wanted to save him from her himself. So she asked for a death potion. But in the end, she didn't dare to go through with it and kill her husband. Um, so she ended up giving birth to Anin, and she knew that Kellogg was gonna use Anin to set up the deal so he could be immortal. So she basically took the potion herself, so she didn't have to see any of that. So that's what happened there. And Siofra's telling Anin all of this, so you know, it all makes sense in the end, I guess. But after like a day, Anine is like, you know, can we just go to your third sister? Because we need to discuss this thing. And they can only stay there for like a day before they die. Uh, which the shadow sisters don't really seem to comprehend. They decide to go to the third and final sister. Rionach, I think is she called. And Anine is basically parched. Like, she needs something to drink. ASAP. Rian does offer his blood to drink, which he doesn't want to do, I guess it's gross. Um, which, you know, sounds like a biohazard, so I get it. So they arrive at the third sister's house, Riona. She isn't there. And <laughs> the other witches are like, you know, we can just wait for her because we need to talk to her. So it can take a few weeks though. I'm like, <laughs> do we need to wait a few weeks? And Lil is like, you know, we can't have this rumor of us um, being bamboozled spread around. So we need to talk about this now. We can't wait for Rionach to get back. And the sisters agree to 
keep it between them and just discuss it between them and just do whatever they decide is right. So they discuss and they have a discussion with Eileen about everything that she says and then they're like, no, okay, like we had the baby. We knew the baby died. We saw it burning in a tree. We heard it scream. Then we left. So we know it died. You're lying. So they don't believe her at all. And at one point, Eileen just can't take it anymore. She's like, I'm the daughter. It's me. So do something with that. So they want her to give one drop of blood so they can unspool it and see who her parents are. And while they're doing that, Rian is like, okay, we need to run through to the human world right now. While they're doing that, now they're distracted. So they find the answer, but we're safe anyway. But he's like, we do need to get the drop of blood back though. So you go, I'm getting the drop of blood. And then he's like, I'm not leaving you behind. So they're stalling. It takes too long. They figure out Anine is indeed the daughter they were looking for. Um, and they're like, <laughs> your blood is ours now. We're gonna, we're gonna get you. And right at that moment, Rionach, the third sister also arrives and they have like, a, they, they try to escape and it's like, oh, exciting. Uh, and somehow, Rion like encourages the forest to, because he's still king of the forest basically, to attack the sisters and that gives them some opportunity to grab the drop of blood, um, get rid of it and leave. So they leave, go back to the human world. They've told the sisters, so they're like, okay, they're going after Kelech now, this is gonna be fine. But now they're in the regular woods again and they hear a horn being blown um, from where Bryn is. So they go back to Bryn, the capital. It's the king's horn. So. It basically means that the people of Bryn are asking for the king's help. So Ron just runs over there because he is being called, basically. And when they arrive there, the first person to drop to his knees to show appreciation to the king or to the prince is Aiden, Arliss's friend, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. And they tell them that they have been basically setting up a rebellion, Arliss. Gogory. And they have been telling everyone about the king for months and now with all the stuff coming out like Kayla running from that fight and uh, just a lot of different things that have been happening, happening more raids, that sort of stuff, um, they figured out like Kayla is not a good guy and we need to get rid of him. So they basically set up a rebellion. Um, but Kayla burnt down all the boats so there's no boat to go to the island and get the actual king. So that's sad. So Rian and Anine decide we need to go to our father, get him, he knows what to do. Um, but there are no boats, so they decide to go to the cave of that guard that they found in book one. That stayed behind in Gara to keep an eye on the country, basically. Uh, and they are like, he had a boat, he had to have a boat because he came back to the island once, so he does have a boat. So they go over to his cave, try and find the boat. Turns out it's only a one person boat. And Rian is like, you need to go because the sisters are after you. Uh, Kalax is after you. You're not safe here at all. So you need to go. And Inine is like, I can't go. I can't confront my father with all the mistakes I've made on my own. I need you there. So I won't go on my own. So in the end, they do decide that Rian is going to go out, look for their father and make sure he returns. And in the meantime, Kalach has drummed up his Lochmore raiders, um, led by Dressed, to attack Bryn. Uh, and to make sure that's not possible, Rian just quickly grows like a giant rose bush hedge around the city. So no one can get out, no one can get in. Uh, so the people are safe. And then he leaves for the island to get their father. Inine is like, okay, Rion's gonna be back basically tomorrow, maybe the day after, if it takes a little bit longer. So I'm just gonna stay in the woods. Ah well, the goddess is keeping her company. And we're just gonna have a good time and wait for Rion to come back, I guess. So they have a lot of discussions together, Ah well and Anine. Anine is also managing to talk to trees now, so that is nice. And for some reason, Ah is like really into Anine and Rion's relationship. Because she does say, there are a few things in all the world that I love more than when you and Rian are together. It's what you were made for. Which I think is a bit weird. Like, is that, like, the goddess is literally telling you that you were made to be with your brother. So yeah, this goddess basically tells her that the only purpose on this earth is to be with Rian, her brother. Which, um, <laughs> it just weirds me out. It weirds me out so much. 
I will basically keep pushing any, like, you know, that vial of blood you have from Rian. Drink it. It's, it's food. You can drink it. And then he's like, I really don't want that. I just, no, I don't want that. I will help her find uh, mushrooms and whatever and stuff she can eat. So she basically lives like that for the next couple weeks or months. It's I'm not sure. It's a long time. And Rian just doesn't get back with Atha. He just doesn't come back. So Ineen asks Awa, like, why are they, why are they keeping so long? And she does explain it. She says that Rian um, arrived at the island and then when he was coming back with the guards and his father, there was a big storm that Awal made that drifted him off course. And he just like, mad about it. There's like a lot of discussion as well. I was like, you know, everything that I've done so far, basically everything that happened to you in these past two years, it happened because I wanted it to happen and it's all for a greater purpose in the end. So just wait. Like she explains, if she didn't make the storm when they were going to Gara, she wouldn't have drifted offshore to Lochmar. She wouldn't have met Freilan. She, she wouldn't have met Erlis. So she wouldn't have any friends. Because I was like, basically everything, like that's something you've wanted all your life, was friends. Because I was basically your only friend, because I was the one who was playing in the sea with you. So I was basically your only friend. So I wanted to give you friends, and now you have them. She also tells Anin about the king's blood rule, because of course that's the whole reason that um, Rian can't marry her. And Anin is like, it's, it's a stupid rule. Why is that a rule? Well, it turns out that it's a vow that was made by the first gardener kings when they got their powers from Awo. And Awo basically said, if you make this promise, then you can keep, as long as you keep that promise, you can keep the power. So she's like, it's a very important vow. And apparently everything that Awo wants is extremely important. So Anine is like, okay, well, it makes sense. So now she suddenly does understand the rule and she agrees with it. They're spending a lot of time together, Ineen learns a lot about herself again in the time. I must say I actually prefer Ineen when she's spending time with Awo, because it seems like she's actually herself. And she doesn't really... Like, she does what Awo wants, but also Awo has her best interest in mind at all times. And when she does what Rian wants, I don't always feel like that's in her best interest, you know? And at a certain point... And Ian is like, you know, I haven't been able to sacrifice to you in a while. Because, you know, she wasn't close to the altar at all. And she couldn't leave the forest. That's what she promised Rian. She's like, okay, I want to sacrifice to you again. We have such a strong bond. I finally want to do the blood sacrifice. She goes out to the altar, of course, out of the woods. She does her sacrifice and she's all happy and everything. And then I was like, you need to go back to the woods now. Something is not right, you need to go back now. Um, so she does go back, but on the way back she spots Arliss. Or at least what she thinks is Arliss. Because as soon as she gets closer, even though I was like, you need to go to the woods, you need to go to safety, please go to the woods. In the meantime, she's walking up to Arliss and then in the end she realizes it's not Arliss. It's Lil, one of the sisters. So she still tries to run towards the woods, but Lil catches up with her first and she kidnaps her and she drags her towards Kaelach's castle. And she basically drops her in front of Kaelach and the other sisters are there as well. And she's basically like, you didn't keep your end of the bargain 18 years ago, so you're gonna do it now. And we want to relish in it. So we're gonna leave now. You're gonna put her in a tree. And you're gonna starve her, you're gonna make her starve, and in like three days she should be dead. So then we'll come back and then we'll check up on her. And then your bargain will be fulfilled and you can keep your shield, your the thing that we agreed on, basically. So they tie her up, put her in a tree, in a cherry tree in the gardens, and she's just left there. And thankfully she's not really alone because she is Awo and she has the cherry tree itself, it talks to her. So that's nice, she's not completely alone while she's dying. And Kaelor does come back like one or two times while she's there to... He tries to apologize to her and she's like, I don't want to hear it. You're trying to kill your daughter. What's up with that? And he explains like how it's all like... How he's like really upset about it because the reason that he... 
he did the thing in the first place, the, the bargain, was because he wanted to take over the throne and he knew that he could never ever defeat the king and his guards, they were too strong. So he needed at least like an immortality spell or something to be able to win. So that's why he got that and he sacrificed his wife for it basically because she didn't want to see any of it. And he sacrificed his daughter just so he can get that. And then when he went out with his immortality shield on to take over the king, the king was like, mm, I'm not gonna fight you, I'm just gonna leave. And he, basically, Caelach is mad that it was so easy and that he had to give up everything for no reason. He just keeps coming back to have these conversations and he tries to apologize, but Ineen doesn't really want to hear any of it, which makes sense. He tried to kill her. He's killing her right now at this moment. So she's just in this tree for a couple of days, three days before the sisters return. She's like slowly dying from thirst. And at a certain point, she's like, oh, well, can you please make it rain so I can drink something? And I was like, I know just the thing, girly. And she gives her a lot of fog, which is just annoying because now she's extra thirsty. She's surrounded by dew droplets and water basically but she can't get any of it to her mouth because she is tied up so basically she gets even more thirsty from the idea of water um but she can't get any but this was all basically a ruse from Awel to convince Inning to just finally drink Rion's blood like you've had it for so long and I want you to drink it. Just drink it, please dear god, just do it. Inine does end up indeed drinking Rion's blood, which I think is just the grossest idea ever. Um, but you know, whatever. Um, and it does help rejuvenate her. And when the next day the sisters arrive to check up on her, she's still alive. Uh, so they're mad, of course. So they're like, you know, the way you did it the first time, you lit her on fire. So this time it's fine if you do that too, I guess. So just light the tree on fire and if she dies then we're good. So that's when they end up setting the tree on fire. But we know right when the tree is burning, you know who arrives? It's Atha, of course it is. He saves Anin from the burning tree, but Anin is captured by Kelag. And Kelag is I, like, I need to kill this girl because I need to keep my powers, especially now Atha is back. But Atha is like, no, you can't kill her because she's not your daughter it's not your blood to spill so the shadow sisters won't accept the offer if you kill her and Kaylax is like what the hell are you talking about and Arthur's like she's not your daughter she's not your blood daughter she really isn't so don't try it and the sisters aren't convinced of course because they read her blood so they know that she is Kaylax's daughter but Arthur's like okay let's make a deal I'll wager my son's blood in exchange so you can wait until dawn if he isn't here before dawn then you can have her anyway uh, if he's here before dawn we can unspool her blood and we'll find out and then you can have my son as well if i'm lying and the sister like <laughs> okay well that sounds not that bad actually so let's do that so they wait and during the night there's actually a really nice conversation between atha and uh, Kaelach, because of course they were besties growing up and everything that happened and Kaelach explained to him like how everything felt and how he missed him and whatever. Um, it's actually a nice moment, I think. So Anine is kind of mad because she's convinced that her father just uh, traded away Rian's life um, with no caution whatsoever. So she's mad and she uh, manages to escape during the night and she comes to Awel's altar and she's like I'm gonna sac sacrifice myself because if I die then there is no wager and then Rion will live and I was like oh my god please girl this is not what you promised him you promised him you would be loyal to him you would serve him as your king as well this is not what he wants don't do that I don't want this sacrifice I refuse and and he was like god why so I will convince her to just go back Sit it out. Just let it happen to you. If you have to die, you'll die, but you'll die in the moment. Whatever. So Anine goes back. She's like really worried because she knows she's Kaelach's daughter. So 
even though the blood would be unspooled again, it will just show again that she's Kenneth's daughter. In the morning, Rion actually comes around before dawn. He manages to get there. So the wager is on and they give a drop of Indian's blood to unspool again. Then it reveals the shocking truth. Indeed, not Kelak's blood flows through her veins. It's actually Atha's blood. So the sisters are like, yeah, I guess you did keep your end of the bargain then, 18 years ago, so where's you gonna go? You can keep your immortality shield, because that was the bargain. And we've had our part of the deal, so we're good, I guess. So they leave. You know, Kelak like, gets to keep his immortality. So he's having like this screaming match against Atha, like berating him from everything, that he had to give up everything in his life to be able to fight him, and then he didn't want to fight him, etc. So while this is happening, actually the vines from the castle garden start growing towards Kelag and grab him and just drag him up to the gardens. And then you just hear a crushing sound and Kelag's gone. And that's how they defeated the man. So it turns out that by drinking Rion's blood during the night, Inion has taken up this blood and is now of the same blood as Rion, so that means she is... Atha's blood. I'm very confused about that, but I guess she's now a blood daughter of Atha as well. Which actually means, let's calculate that back, that she is not even just the adoptive sister of Rian. She is also the blood sister of Rian. So she's his actual sister by blood, right? Am I wrong? Am I right? Am I wrong? Tell me. She's a sister, officially now. Well, it turns out that the cherry tree actually whispered this knowledge to Atha when he was saving Anine from the cherry tree. So that's how Atha knew when he was able to wager and solve this situation, I guess. They uh, explained it in the weeks that it took Rian and Atha to get to the country. Um, they explained what they did. So first, Atha was able to grow all sorts of rose bush hedges around every single village in Gara from the island. Then they left from the island to go to Gara. Um, then they were drifted away by the storm and they went to Dugold, which is a country below Lochmar. So they had to go through the entirety of Dugold and then the entirety of Lochmar and then they would arrive in Gara again. Took a long time, of course. And then as soon as they were in Gara, they had to grow crops inside of all the villages. So the villages would be able to survive. So they just spend days and days, hours per day, you know, gardening basically to make sure that people would survive and not starve in there. So that's why it took them so long to get back to Gara and get back to Inin. There is a magical moment where Rian is finally able to talk to Inin again after all these weeks and he announces to her that they can get married now. Because she is of King's blood now. Doesn't matter that it's the same blood as him. But she's of King's blood now, so they can get married. Really, after book one, I was so convinced that, you know, she had left the incest behind. But the incest actually got worse. It managed to get worse somehow. So they actually get married that same evening. Uh, Anin is now also a gardener because, of course, she has gardener's blood now. But she's not an official gardener because she can't grow the plants herself. So, of course, she can't be the same as Rian. But she can force the plants to weave in a certain pattern because, of course, she's really good at weaving. So they can now work together and he can grow the plants and she can weave them. And she makes her wedding dress like this, which, you know, fun. But also, I think it's so weird that she is officially a gardener now and a gardener king. And they say this, but still she does not have the same powers as Rian and Atha have. So, I don't know, it feels a bit weird to me. They could have just put her on the same level. Is it because she's a woman? Is this blatant sexism? Maybe. But anyway, they get married. She has a good conversation with her father about everything that happened. He forgives her for everything. So that's all good. So, yeah, it all ends well. Kayla is defeated and she gets to marry Rian. I would prefer that than learning that Kaelag is actually the bad guy and she and, and Rian was right and she ends up going back to Rian. If that happens, I'm gonna I'm throw the book out. I will cry. Vuelan also returns from Lochmar at that moment uh, or like a few days later. It turns out he was victorious over his brother Jest and he has taken back Lochmar. He is their new king now. They have a great party. They go to the woods, make themselves a home there. Uh, all the people from the island are brought back to Gara. Um, 
Erin is finally gets to meet her grandmother again, so that's nice. And the country is safe, everyone is happy. What more do you want? Eneen got exactly what she prayed for to Awel years ago. She got all of that, what she wanted. So it's all good. And that's the end of the story. And I have some thoughts. <laughs> First of all, why did the incest get worse? Could we not, like, <sighs> it was already worrisome that she wanted to marry her adoptive brother. Then it was even more worrisome that he actually turned into his her blood brother. And then she was able to marry him. I'm so weirded out. I am really weirded out. I don't like it. I also want to point out like something that to me is really major plot hole in this book. Because it turns out that Atha did actually know that Kerlach was Enin's father. And he kind of explains it as like, yeah, I wanted to tell you when you were 16 and I told you that I was your adoptive father. But you were like a bit sad about it and I didn't want to make it worse. And I didn't want to tell you that your father is this traitor that we know. Um, so I didn't want to burden you with all those thoughts, negative thoughts. So that's why I didn't tell you. But I didn't want to tell you at some point. And that's why I've been telling you all those stories about Kelach when he was young. Because I wanted you to have a good memory of him. If I tell you that he's your father. I wanted you to have a good memory. But he knew exactly who her father was. And then she's like, but why didn't you forbid us from going to Garak if you knew it was this dangerous? Because he knew all the dangers, all of them. And he was just like, yeah, I never wanted to be in your way. I wanted you to do your thing. But also, if he just told her who her father was, then she could have decided to do her own thing and just decide to give up and like not go to Gara at all. But then she could have made an informed decision, you know? Now she was basically just forced to go anyway. Because she needed to find out who her father was. Even though, even though her adoptive father knew exactly who her father was. It just doesn't make sense. They never had to go to Gara in the first place. And also, this entire book also feels unnecessary for the fact that everything in this book that they did was to make sure that Kelach would be mortal again so they could kill him. And in the end, he was still immortal when he was killed by the vines from the garden. So, you know, Rian could have done that all along, like a while ago. He could have just sent those vines up into the castle and just killed Kelach like that. Like, he could have done that basically the second he got to Gara. And the fact that Kelach was immortal didn't really have anything to do with it. So, basically, everything that happened in part three feels redundant and it feels like just for a way to make Inin drink the blood to turn her into an official daughter of Atla. You know, it felt a bit unnecessary, actually. I do really enjoy this Shadow World scene, but the rest of the book was very... It feels, felt, feels really unnecessary in the grand scheme of things, if you think about it. And there's also some things that I don't know yet. Like, remember in the last book, the way Inin found out that Kelach was... Um, that she was Bronach was because Kira the Shadow Witch came over to Kelach and she told Anine that she was Bronach. Why does Kelach have a meeting with Kira? All of the dealings that Kelach had were with the sisters, the Shadow Sisters, the bargain that he had and whatever, the bargain that Myrna had. It was all with the Shadow Sisters and none of it was with Kira. So why was Kira there in the first place? It's never explained. It annoys me. Also, the only reason, like, the big, big plot hole of this story is the fact that they didn't have to go to Gara in the first place. Um, the only reason I can think of, like, why the king would have done that anyway is because Inin prayed to Awal, like, hey, I want to be with Rian forever. And Awal was like, okay, we're going to do this, this, this and this. She's going to almost get killed and then she's going to drink the blood and then... It'll be fine. And I have this entire elaborate plan. So I'm gonna tell her father, Atha, to just accept it and send her over to Gera. And then my plan can go into motion. Even though, like, she could have just said, like, hey, just drink his blood. <laughs> and that would have been it. But, you know, the story was very important for Inin's self-development. Except for the fact that in the final book, a lot of it seems like the entirety of the self-development is just gone. 
which makes me sad. So I did enjoy the final book, especially like the Shadow World scenes, they intrigued me and I was on the edge of my seat and I really like reading them. So I did read this book in one setting, so it was a really fun book to read through, but there's just, the book feels unnecessary in the entirety of the story. It basically, at the end, everything comes out like, oh, we didn't really have to do any of that. So it just feels, it makes the story feel so redundant and like, I didn't really read anything of any value. And I still feel like, you know, having just the first, just reading the first book and interpreting it the way that I did with the um, escaping a toxic relationship and whatever, I feel like that, that, that's what I really thoroughly enjoyed. And then the other two books, they were fine, they were fun to read, but they undid everything that I thought was good about the first book, basically. What I liked about the second book is Anine choosing to become a priestess of Awel and living her life like that. That's what I thoroughly enjoyed about book two. Just seeing her happy, living like that, whatever. There's also a lot of backstory that we're missing here about Fuelan, because he did end up going to Lochmar at the beginning of the book, then we didn't hear anything from him again. And then he came back and he was king of Lochmar. There is a short story, I haven't read it yet. I do have it on my phone, because at the end of the Kindle book, you can sign up for her newsletter and then you'll get the book sent to you. So I do have it. And I'm excited to read it. It's a short story, so I think maybe I'll read it tonight or tomorrow, something like that. It's called The Crown of Swan Feathers. It's because Fuelan wore a crown of swan feathers. And I'm just excited to read that, I guess, because it's a lot of backstory that is happening while this book is happening, but you don't know any of it. So, yeah. Anyway, those are all my thoughts. I feel like throughout the series, the books were still really enjoyable to read, but throughout the series just analyzing everything and thinking about everything just makes everything less good towards the end and i still can't get over the fact that she's married to her actual brother now our girl deserves much better i must say like throughout book two like we were talked about in book one in part one we talked about that uh, anine was described as a strong female lead which i thought wasn't really true in book one maybe towards the end of the book but that was also because of the self-development she went through. She had to become the strong female lead. And in book two, she definitely was. So I really enjoyed reading that. In the end, she did become a strong female lead to me. I really liked her, except for the beginning of book three. She was an annoying little brat. And I feel like it's all because of Rian. Like when Rian was gone, she was doing great. And when Rian was there, she lost all of her maturity and her clear thinking and everything. So I feel like Rian is not good for her. She could do better. So, yeah, that's my conclusion of this final book, The Prize of a Kingdom, by Monica Booth, the final book in the Guardian of Kings trilogy. Still, if you want to read, like, because, of course, you don't get the way of writing, the storyline and everything throughout this video, so you just get me summarizing the story, hopefully in a bit of an entertaining, funny way. If you enjoyed this, like, the storyline, just read the book, because it's written in a very fun way. I really enjoyed reading it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me. If you want to see even more from me, my blog, my socials, and my Instagram mainly where I post look like this is all linked down below, so you can check that out as well. That's going to be for me today. And I thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Toodles!